Uh, all right, it's time to, um, to kick off with um, our first um, speaker uh, or speakers uh, this morning. Uh, and uh, with my Land Lab hat on for a second, um, because we have the pleasure at the moment of working on a, a really interesting and significant project in, in Tamaki uh, with, uh, with, with Kate and Tama, um, to introduce Kate and Tama from SCAPE out of New York. Um, so Kate is the founding principal of SCAPE uh, and is well known for leading complex, creative and collaborative work processes that advance broad environmental and social prerogatives. Kate focuses on retooling the practice of landscape architecture relative to the uncertainty of climate change and creating spaces to foster social life, which she has explored through publications, activism, research and projects. Tama is a Māori designer that has recently relocated back to Aotearoa after being based in New York for the last three years. He now consults remotely for SCAPE, helping to lead design efforts on projects around the Pacific Rim. Tama has a keen interest in exploring cultural narratives, co-designing with local communities, and integrating resilient design-led outcomes. Kate and Tama will discuss what is the role of physical landscape projects in regional transformation, presenting projects from the SCAPE office that highlight these challenges and opportunities for change and healing. Um, please welcome Kate and Tama. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Kate Orff. I'm here with Tama. Thank you, Henry, and thank you, NZILA, and all of the sponsors of the conference. This is an incredible day. Yesterday, I really was inspired by the, the warm kind of conversational tone and the exchange, and so I'm going to um, speak this morning and then hope that we can take a few questions together. I'm going to present two projects, and Tama's going to talk a little bit more about uh, Tera Tukutuku, uh, that Henry just mentioned. So, kia ora. I'm very pleased to be here. I love uh, being uh, 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 in this country. It's incredible. And I thought to start, uh, uh, and the reason it's incredible is because there is a sort of a landscape undercurrent, a kind of a deep feeling of landscape knowledge that exists here that, frankly, I don't see in the United States. So, you have so much here to, to work with and so much incredible potential. And I see what's happened in the United States in terms of you know, our total addiction to fossil fuels and the private car and the sprawling of our cities. There's so much here. I feel like this is a critical moment for all of you in the room. And uh, I just am, and, and, uh, am, am happy to be a part of it because you're really on the, the cutting edge of what the future is gonna look like. So I thought to start with this little Venn diagram because another thing that I learned a little bit in talking to some of you is that um, what I'm doing, or I might not exist here in, in the same way in the sense that I'm, I'm a practicing um, academic. So I have a full-time position at Columbia University, which I understand you have to have a PhD to, to be in university here. Um, and I'm also leading the firm SCAPE. And so this is a little bit of like, you can all correct me afterwards in the Q&A, but that's my understanding. So this is the sort of Venn diagram of, of how these kind of pieces have come together for me and how I feel like I've tried to sort of push and influence the profession from within and without, really kind of grounding um, our work in the best available climate science and, and, and sort of ad adaptation of the built environment, focusing on physical planning and construction, really kind of trying to build the example, and then pushing the cultural narrative in, in very broad front ways, whether it's on CNN or The New Yorker or PBS or Time Magazine, really trying to reach the broadest possible kind of ears and eyeballs, if you will, in American culture. And I've tried to do that through writing, research, and, and activism. But first, and I'm sure you are all grappling with this as well, um, um, I wanted to start with a publication very quickly called Petrochemical America, because that is really the root of what I feel like we've been talking about in the past day about regenerative design and all, and all of our, our work. We're trying to find that regenerative cycle. But the reality is, is that we have uh, built our economy in the US, of course, out of a one-way cycle of extraction of fossil fuels, the transmission of that into waste products, into carbon dioxide, into the air, contributing to 
global climate collapse, and then uh, uh, and then we have we have a landscape that just exists in the wake of these uh, these these factories, and and this sort of petrochemical reality. So this book was. Um, uh, an attempt to try to weave together that narrative and to set the table for a much more radical practice of landscape architecture that's taking on, frankly, the root of the challenge, which is fossil fuel extraction and waste and, and global warming. So, oh, my GIF isn't working, but this is the, a, a, an image of the book and um, it was done in concert with the eminent photographer Richard Mizrak. And so, my drawings and text are kind of exist in dialogue with Richard's kind of epic photos uh, in the book, and together they kind of paint this portrait of, you know, literally the petrochemical America that has driven, um, driven essentially, created the context for the much more, you know, frankly modest physical landscapes that we live and work in. So it's a hope to get more back to the root, back to the kind of radical root of truly what has formed the American landscape, not just the design as a modest intervention, but truly get to the root. So in the book, we mapped cycles of extraction and offered alternative models, policies, and visions to trans transition away. On a more positive note, and that's really where I'm trying to hit in terms of the, the, the sort of baseline of American culture, I contributed a, a chapter to this New York Times best-selling book called All We Can Save, Truth, Courage, and Solutions for the Climate Crisis. And, and so this was, um, I feel like, a publication that is a scaling uh, effort in the sense that as a group of authors, um, we developed also reading circles. So the book exists as a book, but it also exists as a kind of a tool to spark social movements. So the book came with a kind of a teaching kit and uh, discussion circles, et cetera, for people all across the United States to sort of get it, read about it, and integrate it into book clubs where, you know, and I've talked with people from Annapolis, Maryland, to, uh, to Des Moines, Iowa. So this is the poem that kind of launches my, my chapter called Reshape, Problems Embedded in the Contours of Cities, Transport, Infrastructure, Capitalism, Coastlines and Landscapes Where Human Nature Meet, Much to Consider, Rend, Invert, and Remake. So all that is to say that um, you know, trying, to, trying to push in through words and through books and publications and through projects is something that um, I found a very creative tension in doing. This publication is really more about the early work of the skate practice um, and it just describes our approach as being eco-aware, collaborative, being systems thinkers, and, and very engaged. And that's really the, the root of how we do our work. And in many ways, SCAPE is a, a great practice. We're 90 people, we have offices in New York, New Orleans, and San Francisco. And we have projects as diverse as you know, a small plaza outside a library to, to literally uh, working on the entire uh, Louisiana Coastal Master Plan uh, uh, in, uh, for the state of Louisiana. Broad in scale, and, and the, really, the, the challenge is to really shift scales and bring that sort of landscape thinking to bear. I also have sort of a political hat in the sense of um, participating on this exciting um, commission, the Commission on Accelerating Climate Action for the federal government. Our, our, audi our audience for this commission is the um, the, um, the Congress of the United States pushing basically um, uh, uh, what Koch called about like taking the hammer and breaking down the silos. This is literally trying to, a document that's trying to push and break the silos down at the federal level uh, in terms of how we've even organized ourselves uh, to um, get uh, more accelerated permitting on um, decarbonization and landscape uh, 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 reclamation projects. So that's an exciting, exciting kind of uh, uh, just aspect of what I've been able to, to, to conversations that I've been able to be involved in. So to the meat of the, the talk today, because you know, looking at petrochemical America, thinking about what is really the role of landscape architecture in this kind of transformation process of land, water, people. What sparks regional transformation is, you know, on one hand, a kind of a talent for and a thought, thought process that is very design driven, but on the other hand, it takes very, very different skill sets. 
It takes a general stance of, of openness, right? The, what we've been talking about, which is about, about listening, about understanding, about the change process and the role of, of, of design and planning in that change process. It takes, at least in the United States, political will across what we would have as the federal, state, and local governmental levels that often are deeply, deeply misaligned. Um, social capital, collaboration, this environmental ethos, funding, and a long-term perspective. And so, you know, the subtitle of this talk could be Falling in Love with a Salt Marsh, because what I've sort of learned about regional transformation, I learned from a first book when I first moved to New York, Falling in Love with Jamaica Bay, uh, which you can see on the top right uh, uh, corner. So this was actually a book project and a mapping project about why was this bay collapsing? And you have, you know, we've discussed yesterday the challenges here in, in Nelson. But so really getting at the root of how to make landscape change, you really realize very quickly that the edges of your drawing board in landscape architecture are not really enough, that you have to go into these alternate kind of forms of politics, um, ideation, and, um, uh, and communication to really get things done. You also have to work at very different scales. Um, but I wanted to put this... Um, this image up because um, what Tom is going to talk about also with, uh, with our work here in um, Tara Tukutuku, this entire project was inspired by um, how the Lenny and Lenape uh, would essentially farm Jamaica Bay. Even though we kind of look back and think that there is a sort of a pure nature, there were um, shell middens, essentially kind of shell farms, uh, farm, they were farming the, the forest and selectively burning. And so for me, that kind of image of this cultivated nature, not that human and nature are apart, but that, that there could be this very strong interplay of, of care and stewardship resulting in a, a sort of um, a coexistence that was uh, uh, tenuous but, but driven by, um, uh, by this kind of love and, and cultivation of the landscape was very inspirational. And that led directly to this project of 2009, which is called Oyster Texture. So this was my sort of first breakout project for, uh, it was exhibited in the Museum of Modern Art. And this was because um, someone asked, well, what would the future of New York and climate change look like? And so this image was sort of put out into the culture, but it was at the very moment when what was called yesterday the pipe engineers or the pipe and wall, I would call engineers, were debating about how high the seawall would be that would block off New York's harbor from the Atlantic Ocean. So there was this sort of vision put out in the world, and then there was this vision of the, the you know, multi-billion dollar seawall. And, and so what was very exciting about oyster texture, and this was a project that um, was inspired by the life cycle of the oyster. It really kind of brought, like I mentioned, um, with the, the sort of the Lenny and Lenape concept, people together to the water's edge to uh, help build and steward um, a reef that you can see here on the right to help slow the water, clean the water, and uh, build a better relationship with that water, kind of hitting the reset button between cities and the urban environment. So that was presented in various formats. Um, and, um, and, and this project then kind of was put out into the world as an alternative version of the pipe and wall engineering, and it really took hold. And I love this, this, this image because this is the image from my work in, in Jamaica Bay, from that book that I showed you earlier. Um, on the, right, the left-hand side here, you can see this sort of federal project, a top-down project of sort of sediment reuse an island rebuilding because these islands have been disappearing because of a range of factors, sea level rise, excess nitrogen, et cetera. And on the right-hand side is volunteers from um, the American Littoral Society. So this was my clue from Jamaica Bay. I put it to work in oyster texture uh, and kind of brought that sort of rawness of bringing together you know, the, the idea of the physical landscape project and the sort of social context or forms of social life um, uh, and really kind of putting them together in a very direct framework that has been driven, drive, driving the work ever since. So in general, I would say, and back to my, my essay and All We Can Save called Mending the Landscape, that nature is a matter of design now, whether or not uh, we uh, intend that to be. So this kind of raw co collapse of the sort of 
social and the physical, um, was carried forward in a project that's now constructed called Living Breakwaters. So I'm going to go through some slides fairly quickly to tell you and, and to describe this project to you. Um, but essentially, what happened, uh, and, and with this idea of pulling forward pairing forms of social life and ecological regeneration uh, strategies, um, and really putting out in the world that landscape can be a template for thinking and acting relative to climate change and the climate imagination. And I found that the, the sweet spot in this kind of change process and the scalar process is really, um, you know, obviously much work to be done on individual levels, uh, turning that light switch off, recycling, etc. Much to be done on the global scale, but that landscape sort of hits that sweet spot of community uh, spaces and community scales and the concept of shared actions that can really be uh, driving things forward. So after oyster texture in 20. 2009, Superstorm Sandy hit the New York region. And uh, this um, changed everything. Um, it was a, an, an epic event. Um, we had uh, water on our streets. Uh, on the top right, you can see we had boats crashing into houses in Staten Island. And it was a massive wake-up call. So even though oyster texture existed within the four walls of the Museum of Modern Art, and I would say very much in the public's imagination at that point. Um, I was called with SCAPE to develop uh, by Mayor Bloomberg a comprehensive coastal protection plan uh, for the city of New York. So we worked on a big team with engineers and cost estimators, et cetera. And you can see here, no wall at the edge of the harbor. And so we basically kind of brought those ideas forward at the scale of the New York Harbor, pairing ecological uh, and sort of shore protection and, and shoreline strategies with neighborhood contexts. There was also a federal competition called Rebuild by Design, in which we began to, uh, which was the idea to bring innovation and infrastructure forward. So we began to test these concepts and model these concepts of ecological infrastructure at a very, very broad scale in the New York Harbor, uh, looking where dredge wetlands or tidal flats or habitat breakwaters, dunes and berms could be integrated into our coastal environment. And, and from that, we decided uh, and we were uh, awarded this project called Living Breakwaters, which is in Raritan Bay uh, near Staten Island. And it tests all those concepts of oyster texture at a one-to-one -one scale. It's located here in this box. And actually, Sandy, if I can do the pointer, came right in through the, the New York Bight. And you can see that Staten Island uh, got hit very hard. We've, of course, dredged our harbor. And so Staten Island experienced extreme erosion and wave, um, uh, wave damage. And so the Breakwaters Project uh, uh, began to uh, address some of these incredible vulnerabilities. So what does it do? Um, it, of course, rebuilds habitat. It slows the water. It cleans the water. Um, and these are breakwaters that you can see in the lower right-hand side that um, have special ecological units and a special form uh, designed into them in order to rebuild uh, what was once you know, a viable and very thriving oyster culture uh, in New York City. Our harbor was once 25% oysters. And so this is a small chance uh, to start to rebuild that kind of rich intertidal cross-section that is both you know, protective, that benefits marine life, and that um, is, um, is so critical to, to a viable future. Here's um, a map of the land lost in Staten Island. And importantly, you know, this is not a project that's trying to solve every problem. This is not a solutions mindset. This is a project that's reducing risk, creating habitat, improving ecosystem health, uh, and, and then being able to kind of bring a kind of a calmer, safer environment to the shoreline. But it has to be done in concert with many other, um, you know, onshore uh, retrofits. So the project was inspired by, you know, of course, the Jamaica Bay example, but also oyster culture that existed uh, off the shore of Staten Island at the time. Again, farmed nature, right? Not a nature that exists necessarily um, outside of us. And so the project, these breakwaters are seeded with oysters. And so through this project, we've been able to fund and advance um, a whole new sort of harbor-wide oyster culture with the Billion Oyster Project that includes new shell curing sites, new min middens, shell middens that kind of mirror uh, what, what is found um, around Jamaica Bay, um, oyster nurseries, et cetera. And we're beginning to pilot 
urban oyster restoration techniques on the breakwaters themselves. And so this is the largest urban uh, marine restoration project uh, in the United States. A little more about the reef streets, the kind of macro and micro complexity that's needed to attract fin fish and shellfish, um, uh, where the adjacent artificial habitat, the habitat that's being rebuilt right now. Um, and what was very exciting is um, we were awarded this um, HUD grant and, um, and uh, we were able to do a, a cut the ribbon moment to begin to start. Um, and um, really began to just, after, um, after the project was funded, uh, did a whole series of design tools and, and breakwater design parameters. We designed the entire project as a pilot to be um, you know, replicated and to be learned from, um, and we uh, tested it in many different ways, uh, both in the modeling space and in um, the... Um, and in, the, uh, in a physical model and a digital model. And the project is also now pushing boundaries against our state policy. Um, the project is what you would say illegal to build. So um, we had to kind of essentially build this project out as a pilot um, um, because um, it is putting fill in the state waters. But importantly, and this is a theme that I wanna just really bring home, is that it's a physical project and all of those things happened, but more importantly, it's literally a kind of a lens around which you know, students and educators can come to the shoreline and learn and begin to steward this project from now into the future. So we have a state-certified science curriculum that is delivered alongside the physical project so that social life and that physical life of the project can move forward and really spark that regional transformation, right? So we have... Um, about 40 onshore uh, Staten Island schools that are participating. We have these resources for teachers that are downloadable um, and easy to incorporate. Uh, and it's really been, um, uh, I would say, the biggest, one of the biggest aspects is fighting for both of the physical and the social components of the project to move forward. Because at many moments in the past eight years, the, the social project had been cut away. Uh, and so, uh, but now we have um, the, the curriculum out um, and, um, and uh, it's been modeled, tested, funded, um, and now built. And so um, uh, we're very excited uh, that uh, in the fall we'll be um, completing this project. And here, it's, it's really kind of, I, I love to say, wow, you're kind of like, okay, this, this guy, Stanley the Seal, showed up right on cue for, uh, for a site visit, and uh, so literally kind of trying to deliver on the promises of the project. But I will say that um, this is, looks, it looks too easy, but what's behind this very kind of cute juxtaposition of the rendering and the reality is eight years of meetings, <laughs> eight years of breaking through red tape, seven binders of an environmental impact statement, because nothing that I showed you of all that interaction with the community counts towards any kind of legal status of engagement uh, and, and a kind of a parallel legal process. So a big win and, and something that is really, really has changed the course of New York's um, history, I would say, in terms of its relationship to the water and its relationship to climate adaptation. So the second project I'm gonna show is the Chattahoochee River Greenway Study. And this is in Atlanta, probably a place that frightens all of you. It is known for its super, its belt, you know, it's a highway. It's known for uh, its, you know, massive highway. It's massive suburban sprawl. And if any city could be retrofitted by a regional transformation landscape, this would be the candidate, Atlanta. And so um, what we're very fortunate to work on is this uh, Chattahoochee River Greenway. And the idea of this project is to make a single contiguous linear trail along the Chattahoochee River in this region, in this, uh, at this scale, which is, look, which is in orange. And you can see Florida, Georgia, Alabama, and the size of the study area, right? So Atlanta is a city of, again, cars and suburbia. And this project has incredible potential to sort of shift that focus, provide alternative non-motorized transportation, and enable people to engage with each other uh, and also to restore the riverbed uh, while doing so. 
So um, I'm really excited about this project because it's moving forward as well. In the US context, um, we have a very degraded tax base and all projects of this scale essentially need a private partner. So this team um, was critical in moving this regional project forward. We had the original commission, the Trust for Public Land, which is essentially a private uh, uh, um, funding partner, Cobb County and the city of Atlanta. So even to um, align those groups, and, and of course our team is, is, is a big team. So over the course of about two years, we, we developed this alignment for this trail um, and, and, and have around over 125 miles of riverlands and 44 tributary trails. And, um, and we are touching essentially a, a million residents that live with now, within now a 15 minute bike ride of the trail. So, you know, why is this important? It's important because this river, you could live, you know, a stone's throw, flow, a stone's throw from this river and not know it exists. It is hidden in Atlanta. It exists under uh, and outside, um, you know, the sort of people's daily lives. And so this trail project is going to be um, a real spark to um, connect up this greater metropolitan region from north to south. It moves through downtown Atlanta, which you can see here in the middle of the image, uh, and, and, and really create a connective fabric and retrofit this connective fabric. And so this is um, a really uh, exciting project that can address the greenfield pressures and, and, and uh, challenges. So I'm gonna flow through some of these slides fairly quickly because um, a lot of this project was one, engagement in trying to find the right alignment of the trail, snipping through private property, uh, another kind of uh, uh, kind of sometimes insurmountable characteristic of the American landscape is you have private property all the way up to the water's edge. So my kind of m operating mode in this project was Edward Scissorhands, just like trying to snip through all of the, the, the factors. And then also to tell the story of this invisible hidden asset um, and, uh, and, and, and bring it from, you know, it's sort of deeper history through today and describe its role in Atlanta's future transformation as a more sustainable city. So we described the river as a way of life, uh, researched the kind of uh, Native American fishing weirs, uh, it, it, it's, it's, its status as a driver of industry, uh, and un uncovered and mapped the relics. Uh, it's uh, the old-fashioned ferry crossings, um, the um, uh, very difficult story of forced relocation. And I'll just take a moment on this slide to say that when I come here uh, and I hear the discussions that you're having um, around uh, Maori and indigenous culture and weaving together cultural narratives, I feel like I'm looking into a window of the future. The kind of conversations you're having now are so far from where we are in the United States. Um, I'm really feeling like what you're doing now is, is gonna be setting a, uh, a roadmap or a template for how all of us are gonna be catching up and, and learning from you. Um, if you see the sign on the Trail of Tears, you can see about the Trail of Tears, the Cherokee uh, were the, the first nations that inhabited the, 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 the Chattahoochee Riverlands. And uh, the, there's a tale of um, extreme violence and forced removal that is somewhere very deep inside the American psyche, but is a conversation that is still very much suppressed and is, is one that needs to come forward. Um, and so there is also incredible leg legacy of slavery in the agricultural economy that is embedded in the story of the Chattahoochee Riverlands. We have um, disenfranchised communities. We have poor black communities living in the wake of pollution, very similar to Cancer Alley. And so telling the story of this landscape, weaving together uh, these stories through maps, diagrams, photography, uh, text, um, began to, you know, it, from this began to emerge the a figure of a river that is as powerful as this figure right here, which is the, the, what is dominating the, the kind of mental map of Atlantans, and this as the mental map of Atlantans, right? We need an entirely new landscape-driven metaphor uh, to help move us forward. And that's where this kind of concept of this, this incredible resource, the river, has become a catalyst for activism, past, present, and I hope future. 
Um, this is our president, former president, Jimmy Carter, here. He was part of a group called Friends of the River. Um, and his work, you know, this is a multi-generational project, his work uh, and the work of, of state legislatures around that time uh, uh, to clean the water so that we could uh, come back and have a, a relationship with that water. Uh, it was a catalyst for activism. Uh, the, this thing called the Metropolitan River MERPA Act was passed. Uh, and so only now, my generation, can pick up the baton from, from that, these, these incredible acts and uh, begin to think about returning to that river and see it as a river uh, in recovery. It was so dead, it was so polluted, and it was so um, uh, sort of put in the back of everybody's mind that it's an incredible thing to see the water quality improvements, to see people returning to the river itself. So all this is to say that we developed a very dense master plan um, and we conducted about 100, over 100 public engagement activities along the river in different ways. So we had you know, boat tours, we had driving tours where we went into uh, communities, um, learned and, and discussed what was important and why. Um, we were very creative, thinking outside of the box. This was a, a river ramble, um, one of many river rambles we hosted that was uh, for um, impaired people. So we developed a, a braille um, a tour of the river and then this braille um, kind of, um, this, the results of this tour then have found its way into the signage interpretation uh, along, the, on, along the river lands. So this was an accessibility river ramble to see what parts uh, were inaccessible and why. Um, we um, motivated and worked with um, youth and uh, uh, families. Uh, we gave about 30 students cameras to document their own river ramble um, and, uh, uh, and sort of really bringing this idea of bringing people to the river's edge. And this is the engagement in numbers, if you will. And this was both deeply inspiring and also crushing for the SCAPE team because after this project ended, we were all kind of uh, sapped of, of our ability to, to work and the emotions were, were very, very strong. So we met with over 700 people, um, including uh, working group participants, stakeholders, and, and conducted this very, very creative outreach. And the purpose of that is, is really to refigure the landscape, right? To bring together that social life with the physical environment of the river and really kind of pull what was um, started by Jimmy Carter and, and past generations and pull that into the future um, and, and really kind of think about it as a generational project that establishes this new positive identity for the Chattahoochee River, uh, whereas um, in the past it has been seen as a sewer and the backdrop. This is one of my favorite projects, uh, uh, images coming out of this project. Uh, you can see the 72 uh, River Corridor study and then the, our 2019 uh, team here piecing together and trying to um, retrofit and map a contiguous um, uh, sort of connected trail for all that helps to restore the river and uh, all for this alternative mode of movement in the Chattahoochee. This is the map of engagement along the river. And, you know, so this is sort of, you know, what I want to leave you with, with this section, which is that, you know, it is literally this kind of, the physical landscape project itself is both engendering of a social context and receiving the social context. Uh, and so that's a, a, a way that we've tried to work with all of our projects, not just thinking about sort of generic input into a predetermined outcome, but really see the engagement process itself as a way of kind of figuring and bringing um, uh, new forms of coalitions of robust social life together, really creating this kind of cementing this relationship between people and the physical landscape that has been so severed in the American context. So that's the goal to really create a riverlands and an image of the riverlands that is as robust and powerful and that can defeat the image on the right, which is our current status in, in, the, in, in Atlanta. So this project was then, uh, our, I, I'm presenting the master plan in like a more of like a cloud thinking way, but this was an incredibly rigorous report with principles, funded projects, et cetera. This project received funding from various sources, from the Army Corps, from the state, from federal transportation money, uh, and was used by our politicians, just like um, uh, you, you saw with, um, 
living breakwaters to base, basically advance uh, the project into a new construction phase. So SCAPE is now kicking off uh, this construction project, uh, reg uh, Regional Trailhead Park, which is essentially the first phase. So bringing that planning, planning context down to the physical design of uh, the first uh, the first physical uh, embodiment of this trail at this site. And over its 100 linear you know, miles, many, many landscape architects and planners will play a role. So we're excited to get kicked off with this regional trailhead park. So, in more exciting news, <laughs> I'm going to hand the mic over to Tama, and he's going to talk about what brings scape to Aotearoa. Tama. You want, uh, yeah, go ahead. Good everyone. Uh, I'll just add my two cents at the end because I was going to present a project, but we don't have enough time. So uh, you didn't pay to come see me. You came to see Kate. <laughs> um, anyway, so what brings? Uh, oh, I've got two mics. No, use the hand mic. Uh, uh, so what brings Scape to Aotearoa? Um, well, a few reasons. Uh, kind of mentioned before. Uh, First, Nation, First Nations engagement in the States is, if nothing, so um, we're really looking towards uh, Aotearoa to kind of lead the way. Um, you guys should all be really proud of yourselves. <laughs> um, definitely the most progressive place in the world that are actually engaging with uh, First Nations um, and like beginning that co-design process. Um, obviously nothing's perfect and there's like a long way to go, but I mean, there's absolutely nothing in the States, so it's a huge um, kind of undertaking that the world needs to start investing in, and um, hence the reason why we really wanted to come to Aotearoa and team up with some of the local teams, uh, Land Lab and the likes of uh, Warren and Mani and all that that are on the team uh, for Te Aratukutuku. So Te Aratukutuku, Probably some of you are familiar, it's probably a bit contentious because you probably also bid on the project, but <laughs> sorry, we got it. <laughs> um, but anyway, we're all friends, right? So um, yeah, it's a great project. Um, it's kind of first of its kind in terms of uh, process and methodology. So um, I can't share too many slides today because it's too early, but maybe in a few months time we can do a, a little uh, presentation or something, public presentation. Um, so I guess with this process, what makes it different is uh, there's basically two phases before you even get to concept design. Mm. Um, and those are called the discovery and interpretation phase, um, which is basically just building relationships, right? It's having a cup of tea, it's meeting with the local people, with the mana, uh, with mana whenua, iwi and hapu, um, and it's just getting, you know, personal uh, first name basis, um, and sharing the stage. Um, so bringing them in from the get-go, um, they kind of sit hand in hand with our, our client, which is Ike Panuku, um, and it's just off to the right start. Um, and through these two extra phases, discovery interpretation, and then the second phase, vision phase, it's basically a time to kind of work out all the kinks in terms of components of a park um, or development, um, figuring out what what works, what doesn't, what we intend for the space, uh, what kind of are the aspirations for the space. Um, and then, you know, it's really pins down, open ears, um, and just, yeah, again, building relationships. So I guess one thing about this park that's also a little different is the kind of, well, we'll just talk about the name, Te Aratukutuku. What does it mean? Te Aratukutuku was um, gifted by Mana Whenua it's basically a metaphor for the binding of land, sea, and people. Um, also land and sea, but obviously people play a big part in that um, kind of relationship. Um, as has been mentioned by other speakers um, here, it's, um, it's all about you know, that social cohesion and uh, stewardship or kaitiakitanga of the land. So um, leading with a name like this is kind of like a really a big step and kind of drives the um, vision for the entire project. Um, so Te Aratukutuku's location is uh, just north of Winyu Kora, you're probably all familiar with that. Um, it's kind of positioned within the Tawaitamata is pretty ideal. Um, it's highly visible from the Harbour Bridge 
um, it has amazing aspects out to Rangitoto and then back to the city. Um, it's probably, its intention is for it to be a completely different park from the rest of the waterfront. Um, you know, the rest of the waterfront is typical harbour, um, wharf structures, um, piers, uh, a lot of asphalt paving, hardscape. Um, I guess the desire for this place is really to, for that weaving um, kind of metaphor to be of, of land and sea is to be more naturalistic. Um, but obviously we're working on a reclaimed site. So mm. this was uh, what, five or 10 years ago? Oh, before America's, America's Cup. Um, Shell, BP, Mobile, all those types of uh, silos on, on the land. Uh, it's petrochemical central, um, highly contaminated and you know, just like a really poor starting condition for a project. So there's a lot of processes that need to go uh, at the start to kind of inform how we design a park and like what that means, right? So we've got a few different concepts that we're uh, using or approaches, um, which is kind of that kind of heal is the first step um, and really seeing how we can heal the land first before we even think about designing. So that plays its part in that kind of discovery interpretation uh, and also that vision phase. So thinking about processes in which uh, participants can have a presence on the land before the park's even built. So really the, the design of the park is actually the building of the park rather than the finished product. So um, it's about you know social engagement through and through. Um, how can you get people engaging with the site while there's site remediation? Uh, how can you activate it over time? It's definitely going to take like 10 years to, to even come to fruition, if not more. So uh, how do we get people engaged with the site as it moves along and how do we unlock parcels as we uh, progress? So it's just a view of, of the site uh, kind of today, I guess, um, the aspect towards uh, Rangitoto and it's kind of prominent within Te um, I guess, am I allowed to say this? Uh, <laughs> I'm not too sure, but <laughs> We'll say it anyway. I guess uh, the desire here is, you know, really trying to look towards some of those other headland um, kind of formations and stuff like that. So um, I guess part of that weaving element is also that kind of uh, notion of uh, waka. Uh, and I guess you can kind of see in this image, it kind of represents a, a waka in terms of a landform. Um, it's a bit literal, but um, working with Mana Fena, we've kind of uh, developed this kind of understanding that uh, we can kind of place these things in the landscape. You know, the Taurapa uh, sits further back, probably behind Victoria Park. You got the Wainga in the middle, which is the body. It's like the heart of the canoe. Um, and that's really where um, development would be. Um, so that's like the heart and the living uh, presence that lives on site. And then uh, the Tau Ihu, which is the the front of uh, the site, which is intended to be, to have a bit of top topographical change, uh, height change, uh, that kind of emphasizes some of the other headlands that occur naturally, uh, naturally around the Te Watimata. Uh, so yeah, you can kind of see around the perimeter, uh, we're working with some pretty uh, undesirable kind of waterfront conditions, uh, a lot of riprap, um, a lot of, uh, leftover asphalt, uh, retaining walls and stuff like that. So uh, from the past presentations, we're really trying to bring in some of that thinking from an international perspective and uh, trying to unlock the full potential of site. So um, there's some definitely <laughs> exciting things that will be here uh, and hopefully we can share with them, uh, share, you, share them with you guys uh, in the near future. But yeah, that's what brings SCAPE to Aotearoa. Um, we're learning from you guys. So take your hat off, um, <laughs> pat on the back, <laughs> and uh, hopefully we can, uh, yeah, create something uh, amazing. Oh, whoops, I forgot there's actually more slides. <laughs> well, I guess, yeah. I'll, okay, quickly, quickly, quickly. No, no quickly, it's okay. Um, it's okay. I guess also in that is that kind of like staging or phasing uh, aspect to the project and kind of some of the, uh, Things we've been working with uh, Mana Whenua through these two extra design phases is um, kind of like the processes or practices or how would people engage with site over time. So 
when we think about now, what can we do in the next two to three years? Um, obviously, we've got to remediate the land, so that whole uh, thing about reusing harbour dredge, uh, bioremediate the soil, but approaching this kind of uh, process with uh, tikanga, you know, like making sure we're doing the right thing, making sure that making sure that healing process is in line and kind of ticks all the right boxes. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's parts of the land that we can activate. Um, we could start composting, stockpiling on site, expanding some sort of nursery that also has some sort of education component. Um, we can start introducing curriculum to get people excited about the project, to have input and to have that kind of public engagement over time. Um, just to help really inform some of the programming and um, other activations that will occur uh, at the headland. Um, I guess a big uh, part of this as well is its proximity to the sea, so really thinking about how we can pilot some uh, marine trials and try to test how we implement things like mussel farms or mussel ropes, uh, mussel beds, uh, kelp, seaweed, how we could grow that and have that actually be an activity that this destination hosts. So like, it's essentially like a, a marine restoration park, right? Like mm -hmm. people are taking their kids there to learn more about the um, flora and fauna that uh, are natural in Te Waitemata. If we skip to the soon, this is kind of more of the, the forming stage, I guess, where we're starting to shift a bit of the earth um, really trying to think about how we reuse um, material, um, so cut and fill and stuff like that, and harbour dredge, which already gets uh, pulled up for the shipping lanes. Um, how can we just use the, the material from that's sourced locally, right? Um, and that really ties in with kind of like the modi of the place, so mana are really on board about, um, you know, using local things. Um, recycling things, things like that. Um, uh, but it's also kind of building that resiliency and um, building identity and purpose, uh, a place that they can be proud of and it's not just got papers from overseas or mm -hmm. things of that nature. And then when we think about the eventually, you can kind of see these diagrams or threads, uh, they kind of spin out. So really fostering that kind of operations of site um, and how people use the land or work the land and then having that extend to the to the further reaches of uh, Tamaki. Um, so, you know, with that kind of marine restoration um, approach, hopefully that can inform other kind of pilot projects that can be implemented throughout Te Waitamata. So this is really the testing ground for all of that stuff and, um, I mean, things, oh, Isthmus has already done muscle ropes down at Tewananga, but it's kind of expanding on stuff that's already been happening in the area and really trying to amplify that effort. So we're all working together, we all got the same goal, so yeah, should be doing more of this. Um, and yeah, thank you guys. Um, it's been a pleasure and cheers. <laughs>
I will say that was a profound just learning experience for myself and the firm, which was sort of taking a core of an idea and then literally driving it through a permitting and funding costing process. So the, 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 the way that the project was ultimately funded is that the, 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 the rocky breakwater structure and the habitat units um, are going in first. So within the habitat units, which are these essentially kind of um, uh, sort of cubes that serve almost as an artificial rock, if you will. Those cubes have spat on shell. They have oyster discs. They're basically, each side of the cube is an experiment on a different way of kind of attaching oysters to the structure as they go in water. So we have a big setting tank. It's actually a kind of, this would be great for Tara Tukutuku. We have a setting tank, which is uh, essentially a, 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 a kind of a big shipping container. And these elements are preset with oyster spat, and then they're placed. Then we have a second round and a whole second sort of mode of oyster cultivation, if you will, that the schools that I showed on Satin Island, all of them have oyster restoration stations at the water's edge. Because the key thing, and as I'm sure you all are aware of, is that you can't just sort of build it and they will come. This is not the case. We don't have oyster larvae in the water. So we have a kind of a belt and suspenders approach where there's preset units within the structure, and then we have oyster restoration stations putting larvae in the water. So that larvae will eventually move around the harbor and then settle on, uh, on the structure itself. Um, and then so that second piece of the uh, schools and oyster restoration station was carved out of the project um, and is being sort of, it's a separate contract. So um, that's how it's working. Two different, two different ways. And it's been great at a, to have, and I mean, it's just a, a, an aside, but what's been exciting about when I first started working with the, what was called then, well, what's called the New York Harbor School, that was back in 2008, 2009. And then what happened is a, a nonprofit, and I'm on the board of that <laughs> nonprofit, evolved into something called the Billion Oyster Project, which then enabled a lot of flexibility relative to getting outside sources of funding. So, um, so the Billion Oyster Project is our partner relative to uh, working with schools on the shore. Um, and it's a, it's a great model because it means that there's, you know, you're both working within the schools with this curriculum, but then you have a kind of a, uh, what in the United States, it's incredibly strict, like what you have to learn. You have to do biology in this grade and so I don't know. And the, what happens with Billion Oyster Project is it frees it up to make it a voluntary after school activity or club so students can be involved um, both within the classroom and also on their own time. It's a great model. Any more? We've got a couple more questions from the floor. Kia that was uh, great. Love, I've lived in New York, so I always love to see the innovation coming out of New York. Um, so clearly an adaption project and a big green infrastructure adaption project. As part of your design process, uh, did you look at the mitigation costs of building and the materials and the construction process? Was that carbon calculated out as part of your design process? Yes, well, we, uh, uh, the biggest impact is from the stone. And so we researched, I don't know, we have a map of a thousand quarries. And so the stone was barged from upstate. So, uh, and then we have a kind of a um, staging area on, on the New Jersey side. And so, yeah, so that was, a big, that was a big part of it. And I do feel like, I do feel like, you know, we have to do both of those things together, obviously. You know, I don't think there's a scenario in which, I mean, the alternative was, um, you know, an 18 foot, concrete wall <laughs> that sort of cuts the harbor off. So I, I definitely feel like there's got to be room for innovation and flexibility with some of this work. And a big part of the way that I like to talk about it is that we are losing our precious ecological infrastructure in an asymptotic way. It's not just like that the oysters are gone. It's that they went from 25% to 0% in, in, a, in a matter of years in the New York landscape. Similarly, our upland forests are being deforested. We have, you know, global wetlands crisis where you have sea level rise, uh, you know, kind of very dramatically 
inundating and, and uh, drowning uh, these kind of very, very subtle inter, um, intertidal gradients. So I, I'm sort of feeling like we need to really build these lifelines for species to kind of coexist until we can get that carbon down um, and that we do need to be sort of a little bit more aggressive about what needs to be done to give what I would call like a nature assist, right, which is literally the rocky substructure here. Um, and in other cases, it might be a mangrove, uh, you know, a sort of a breakwater or something to enable mangroves to re, re, uh, re kind of regrow. Um, so, so that was calculated. I don't, you know, I don't think, I don't know what the ultimate tabulation was. There was an investment in the carbon and the construction of the thing. Um, but um, I think the alternative is much worse. And I do feel like more globally, we have to invest in the preservation of what is being lost um, in a pretty, pretty aggressive way um, uh, so that we can, um, you know, so that we can at least see some of these species in the future. Um, and of course, that doesn't absolve us of the duty and the need to dramatically reduce our carbon emissions to zero, but I kind of see that not happening also anytime soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I just had a quick question about um, some, tr trying to understand some of the tactics or a little bit more of the tactics undertaken to wedge in those pre-designed, pre-concept sta stages that you mentioned Tama, or the social with the physical, you know, understanding that sometimes these briefs are, are quite strict. And yeah, it'd be just great to understand some of those, yeah, those ongoing works or, you know, does it happen in the, is it political will or practice clout? That these kind of work to undertake, yeah, just these, these wedges into the work that you've, you've been presenting. Yeah, I guess in terms of a process that was kind of led by uh, Ekipanuku, so they definitely initiated following this new methodology, um, and that's some sort of relationship that they've built with Mana Whenua and Tamaki. Um, so it's not a process that can necessarily be easily applied to, say, other councils around the country, but hopefully, if the outcome's good, um, people could look to this as kind of like a catalyst for change, I guess, in terms of process. Um, you know, and it's not perfect, but you know, you've got to be moving in the right direction. And I feel like this is, instead of backtracking or kind of, you know, bringing in uh, mana whenua at the end, which is typically what we've done on projects in the past, you know, decade or more, um, just to add a PO or something is just not, not really acceptable, you know, like um, we're beyond that. So um, hopefully this project can kind of serve as that, yeah, that change, you know, and not just in Aotearoa, but also in, like overseas, right? Like people are looking at Aotearoa from Australia, from the States, from Canada. So they're all on their own path for reconciliation. And I think, you know, if we can all just kind of, uh, someone said the other day, you've got like one shot, right? To kind of, to sell to, to a client or a developer. Um, and I feel like if you can show them that a successful outcome from working with mana whenua or just any indigenous group or local community, um, it makes that conversation easier. It's less about the dollar sign and more about the social value that it adds to, to a local community and how it's celebrated. So, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question, but it kind of, yeah, hopefully we can share some more kind of diagrams about how those processes work, like, in a few more months when we get the, the go-ahead, but I might get in trouble if I <laughs> <laughs> show too much right now. Yeah, sorry. It's the hardest thing, right, to create space at the beginning of a project and not just be like, how big should the blank be, you know, one basketball court, you know, it, but this, this is just a, a unique process, certainly, and it's something that also with the Living Breakwaters project, you know, there was a, that, that didn't, well, that, that, that didn't exist, like it came out of a process, so that was also a unique moment um, where there was just a lot of space and time to kind of try to surface what should happen, not to just implement something that was already conceived, and that's um, a big part of what Tara Tukutuko is, it's like coming in with just a conversation, not 
a program in mind that we're just sketching out. Pins down. Pins down. Don't come to the meeting with a sketch. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Now we've got time for one more. Catherine. Kia ora. That was a really great um, talk. Thank you. Very inspiring. Um, Kate, I was wondering about um, the funding slashes that occurred to the EPA, I think back in 2020 under the Trump administration, and how that may have trickled down and have impacted um, the likes of the Trust for Public Land and other agencies, and how in th that in turn um, may have impacted some of this work that you've been showing, and then in that context, thinking about what's happening in Auckland with a potential slash of funding to the likes of Ikepanuku, um, and maybe making some kind of um, comparison mm -hmm. there. Oh, a difficult question, but so, so relevant. And um, I can tell you that after having personally a good cry once Donald Trump won the presidency, and basically sitting on the subway and seeing 20 other people also crying, um, you know, that later that week, that it was just kind of like picking yourself up off the floor and trying to say, what is our strategy? And interestingly with us, you know, the EPA was funded, our Living Breakwaters was funded through HUD, Housing and Urban Development, because they, execute what is called CBDG, DR, Disaster Recovery Funds. And so then I thought, I have a new best friend, and my new best friend is whoever he appoints to the head of HUD. And so basically what, what happened is, I think because of the community buy-in, that we had Republican local senators uh, and local officials all bought into the Breakwaters project that, um, and I won't go into detail, but he um, appointed a party planner to the head of HUD um, in all seriousness. So I was out uh, in Staten Island visiting the site with the new head of HUD and her people within about three months. And literally, and I, I'm, I'm just ad-libbing here, but she literally was like, this is so cool. So I was like, okay. And then I went and hid in the shrubbery. So, <laughs> but basically it, I, I actually feel like the, what, what we were just talking about, and, uh, which is this kind of initial buy-in and this moment when the project, of course, has a life in people's minds well beyond uh, our scope, that that's the moment of power when the expectation is set. And so, a politician in office realizes that that's an asset and not a liability. What will happen in uh, in in Tamaki is is a new is an open question. But I do feel like the, there's power in the process right now um, that that makes it very difficult to to walk back from. And and slowly, I mean, we have big progress in in the U.S. too. We have um, um, Deb Deb Havland in the uh, in the chair now for our Department of Interior. And you just realize that elections have profound consequences because our entire um, EPA was gutted, um, our um, HUD was gutted, uh, and intentionally, intentionally almost, uh, what would you call it? I mean, intentionally almost destroyed from, from within um, with corruption, et cetera. So, um, so all I can say is that there is some power in the getting these projects through images that we make, through drawings, through events, through engagement, out in the public realm and, and you know, out in, in, in a place where like people are like, feels inevitable. Um, and, then, and then it becomes very difficult for uh, one election or another election to change the course, um, that course. But um, we are having an election coming up soon and the stakes are very high, a federal election. Uh, I'll just add to that quickly, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but in terms of funding uh, for Te Ara Tuku Tuku, uh, yeah, that's an interesting conversation because I feel like 
we should be investigating some sort of, or forms of public-private um, partnerships. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it comes with its pros and cons. Um, but I feel like, you know, there could be components of, of that space that could be um, founded with that kind of um, the funding model, I guess. Um, and even, like, the inception of potential, like, non-profits to help maintain or run parts of, of that park or that uh, marine restoration thing around the coast. Um, I feel like, yeah, we need to take steps and kind of thinking about who would head those things and how funding is related to that and, you know, how that's perpetuated into the future of, of, of like, a park or something, you know? Um, similar to, like, uh, non-profits that exist, like, on the High Line. I don't know if you're familiar with, with that in New York, but, you know, setting up non-profits where you can get silent donors um, well, and you can get donors that want their name put on everything, but I don't think we want that in New Zealand. But, you know, there are ways, and there's, I think there's definitely things that we could be looking into more in, in Aotearoa, yeah, specifically. But, yeah, cut off. Cool. Thanks, um, Kate and Tama. It's a real privilege to be working with these guys and, and the fact that they have... Um, you know, worked on and delivered some projects in, in some different ways and um, you know, I think that's really informative for, for all of us as we face some of the challenges that we've been talking about. So um, big thank you Kate and Tama. Thanks. <laughs>